Heavenly Father, this morning as your church is gathered here, I pray that you'll send your Holy Spirit in a powerful way to speak straight to our hearts and our minds, nudge us forward, challenge us, move us, whatever you have to do, but just speak to us now. We love you so much, in Jesus' name, amen. No matter which social media platform you're on, if it's Facebook for you millennials and older, if it's Instagram, if it is Snapchat, if it is TikTok, uh, maybe some of you are just YouTube addicts, no matter which um, virtual assistant you choose to use, if it's Alexa, if it's Siri, or if it's Google, no matter which smart devices you choose at home, the algorithm is always listening. We talk about the algorithm. We talk about the algorithm like it's one of our best friends that just kind of eavesdrops over our shoulders all the time. It's always listening. You know the algorithm, right? Am I the only one? You know the algorithm? You, you, a few of thank you guys, FLA, you, you know what the algorithm is. It's always listening. In fact, uh, I, recently I was talking to somebody about uh, engagement rings. Uh, they were telling me about these engagement rings. I don't need that. I'm past that stage in life. All of a sudden, what pops up on my phone? Ads for engagement rings. In fact, now you will have ads for engagement rings on your phones because the algorithm is always listening. It's always listening. It's choosing what's best for you, what it thinks you want to see, even if you don't know what you want to see. It's interesting that, that spouses have wised up. In fact, they are using the algorithm for their own benefit. This is just genius. Now you husbands and wives, you know uh, what to do. Uh, if your spouse leaves your phone around, uh, you, you can seize this opportunity of speaking into the algorithm for your husband or your wife just to help them along in choosing different gifts for you. In fact, people are doing this on TikTok. Here, here's one lady in, in what she's been trying. How to better communicate. How to close drawers, how to close cabinets. Chanel, Fendi, YSL. Give gift to wife, spa, vacation, massage. How to find things. Babe, have you seen my phone? How to look for something in front of you. It's using the algorithm for your benefit. It's not just wives. Husbands do it as well, especially if you're a golfer. Check this guy out. New driver. PGA Superstore. Golf Galaxy. Mizuno. Titleist. Callaway. Cobra. A gifts for your husband. <laughs> He's trying his best just to work that algorithm. You know what's crazy is you don't even have to be in the same room as somebody to change their algorithm. Because I'm a millennial, I still have Facebook. But what I love to do uh, more than about anything else in life is just to waste time scrolling Instagram, watching the reels. And if you're above 40 or 45, you don't know what a reel is. It's okay. It's just a video clip that's pretty quick. They're always hilarious. If you're like me, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You just enjoy watching these reels and mindlessly scrolling and laughing at these reels. Uh, if you're like me, you probably put kids to bed and then you go out to the living room with your spouse and you sit in front of a, a large screen while each of you looks at a smaller screen in front of you and you send reels to each other waiting for the other person to laugh. Do you do that as well? Am I the only? I feel very lonely right now. You do it too, I know you do. Oh, thank you, we have a hand in the back. Thank you very much. Um, we do this all the time. And in fact, if you uh, were to look at your Instagram and uh, you opened your phone and you hit Instagram and you, the very first post you hit share, another screen would pop up with all your top friends that you share videos with. It brings me great joy to, to make someone else laugh. I know they're gonna laugh when they see this video clip, this reel. My number one is always my wife, where regardless of if she watches them or not, I'm still gonna send them to her. But a close number two, a second, is one of my best friends in the whole world, Ashley Shuley. Here's a picture of her. There she is, there's my friend Ashley. You may know her. She is absolutely incredible. She's basically part of my family. In fact, uh, I've known her for many years. She lived in Atlanta when we lived in Atlanta, and uh, she ended up moving down here about the same time we did as well. She's one of the elders here at Forest Lake Church, and she's just incredible. She's talented. She, uh, uh, she's a teacher at Orlando Junior Academy. She loves to influence kids' lives. Um, she's just, she's confident. She is incredibly genuine. 
And uh, for all of you single guys that are out there that are age 28 to 45-ish, uh, if you're looking for someone that is God-fearing and loves Jesus more than anything else, totally wife material, you can contact her through me. You can just email me, msmith at forestlakechurch.org, and if I think you're good enough, I, I'll connect you. Now, here's the thing. If this sermon lands flat, at least we can find her a husband today. Can I get a witness? But I want to tell you more about Instagram with Ashley. She's a bestie of mine. My kids include her in our family when they say, oh, our family is dad, mom, Catherine Kanan, and Miss Shuley as well. And uh, Ashley and I, we, we, we send reels back and forth so much that we have influenced each other's algorithm. In fact, our algorithms are so close that the majority of reels that we send to each other are the same. Now, if you're like me, when you get a reel from someone, you feel this obligation, like you have to comment or like it or, or react in some way. But when your bestie is this way, you have a little more leeway. See, uh, when she sends me a reel that I've already seen, I do nothing. No reaction, no emojis, no comments, and it's this passive-aggressive communication that we have between each other that, uh, that says, my algorithm is better than your algorithm because I've already seen this. Our algorithms are almost virtually the same. It's funny that algorithms uh, influence you so much. Most of us are always conscious of this algorithm. Uh, in fact, as you're scrolling, whatever you're looking at, uh, if you see something you don't want to see more of, you don't click it, right? You don't touch it. You don't open it. In fact, you scroll quickly past it because you don't want the algorithm to think it knows you better than you know you. In fact, you try to influence the algorithm instead of letting it influence you. Isn't it funny that we are all so aware of the influence of the algorithm of our lives or the influence others have on our feed, yet in real life and in real relationships, we don't think twice about it. Whether it's the latest fashion trend of new shoes or, or mom jeans, or whether it's the latest hairstyle or haircut of buzzing your hair and dyeing it blonde. Can I get a witness, somebody? <laughs> whether it's trying to keep up with the Joneses, whoever they are, but they sure take amazing vacations and post it on social media, am I right? Whether it's getting the latest phone or, or a boat or, or a car or a house, when we stop to think about it, we quickly realize that all too often, instead of influencing the algorithm, it's influencing you. And if it makes you feel any better about yourself, this has been happening to humanity ever since the very, very beginning. And if you have your Bible, I invite you to open it to Genesis chapter 2, where we're going to spend some time this morning, the very beginning of your Bible. Genesis is hard to find because it's at the beginning, and you've got to flip through all those little pages to get to Genesis. Uh, if you didn't bring a Bible, that's okay. I'm going to post it on the screen today so you can see it. I don't normally do that, but we will today. It's at the very begin beginning in the Garden of Eden with a woman named Eve. She's the, uh, the new girl on the block. In fact, she's the only girl on the block, and this is how her story starts. See, God has just spent time, a whole week, creating the world. He's done the light and the water and the land and the animals and the plants and the trees, and he's created Adam. And as he's looking around, there's obviously something missing. And in Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 20, we get to see what happens. Here's what the Bible says. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. And so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man, and the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Now here's the reality. Adam must have been an incredibly intelligent man. I mean, no sin in this guy, no impurities. I'm sure he was super intelligent, uh, but maybe he was just sleepy from waking up from the anesthesia that God gave him. Uh, maybe he was just mesmerized at the beauty of Eve. But I feel like 
the very first pickup in the Bible, pick, pick up line in the Bible should have been better than bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. I feel like that's kind of weak, Adam. Uh, we can give him a pass, but I feel like he could have done better. I mean, he's about to riz up Eve, and he has got to have better pickup line. I mean, I can do better than Adam. I mean, I feel like Adam should have said something like, girl, <laughs> you should be arrested for stealing. You stole my rib, and you're about to steal my heart. I don't know, maybe, maybe he could have gone, maybe he should have said, hey there, I've been waiting for you my whole life. You were made for me. How about this one? You're the only one for me. How, how about this one? I think he could have done this one. Look around, baby. All the other guys are just animals. <laughs> you know, whatever he said, it worked. Because Eve and Adam formed this beautiful relationship and the marriage ceremony had to be incredible as Jesus does this wedding, this incredible wedding in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve in their light covering birthday suits as God performs this marriage between the two of them. And it's the most beautiful thing because it's just Adam and Eve and they're walking with God. They spend time with each other and they spend time with God. The only influence on their life is the voice of God. But suddenly all the bliss comes to a screeching halt as the algorithm changes because of another influence. And we read about it in Genesis chapter three. Here's what it says. Genesis three says this. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. There's Eve, she's at the base of the only tree in the garden where she's not supposed to be. Inspiration tells us that she had wandered away from Adam for some reason, maybe he was playing with the baby leopards, and he said, you go on without me. But she finds herself alone in front of this tree, she's not with her husband, not with the presence of her husband, her best friend, her teammate, but more than that, she's left the presence of God too. And anytime you aren't walking as closely as you can to God, bad things are bound to happen. Anytime you aren't walking hand in hand with God, when you're far enough away from him that you can't hear his voice, when you find yourself on the opposite side of the garden as God, your life is bound to have issues. And it's so easy to do, isn't it? To, to slip away from God, to just drift a little bit out of his presence. I mean, being on the other side of the garden from God is so easy to do. In fact, it takes absolutely zero effort to drift. In fact, I would say it takes intentional work to stay in God's presence and stay connected to him when everything else in life is pulling you away. Everything in life of the American dream. Let me build my life, my house, my, my, my profession. Let me build it all. It, everything pulls you away. Whether it's anxiety and stress and worry and doubt, it pulls you away from the, the all-knowing God. Whether it's politics, can I get a witness, somebody? Whether it's just the world that forces you to take a stance on something one way or the other. Maybe it's just your pride that pulls you away from God. Everything around us seems to pull us away from walking as closely with God as we can, and drifting from his side is just so easy. You know, my family, every summer, for the last bunch of summers, we, uh, we've gone to a lake house, different ones, uh, to be with Jen's family, her brothers and sisters, and all the little cousins, they're there, and, and we've been in Georgia, we've been in Tennessee, we've been in South Carolina, we've gone to different houses, different times, and they're just, just a lot of fun. The cousins hang out, we splash in the water, and we go tubing, and it's just a lot of fun. One year, not too long ago, we went to Lake Chickamauga up in Chattanooga. Maybe you've been there before. Some of you Southern Adventist University alums, you know exactly what I'm talking about. 
It's where the Tennessee River backs up against the Chickamauga Dam and it forms this lake. Well, on VRBO, we looked at all the pictures of the houses and we said, this is the one. And so we rented it and we arrive at this house and it's just like all the pictures show, except that it was about 200 steps from the house down to the lake, a long ways down. You got to work to go have fun. Actually, you got to work after you have fun coming back up the steps. Well, we go down there and we jumped in the water and it's, it's cold. It's already kind of miserable. And we realized that we were so far up the lake from the dam that it's really just a river there. And so as the kids jump into this icy cold water, they begin to float downstream. The current is always moving, it's always pushing. And so in order to stay with the family, in order to stay near the dock, if you were in the water, you were constantly swimming, constantly going against the current, constantly trying to stay with the family because if you didn't work, you would drift away. And when it comes to walking hand in hand with Jesus, I believe that if you aren't constantly growing to know him better, then you're actually probably drifting away from him and not staying in his presence. If you aren't intentionally spending time with him, talking with him, listening for his voice, making space and time to be with him, then you're probably drifting away from him. There are three parts of my job that I love the best. Uh, I love leading, love leading an organization and pushing it somewhere. I love preaching, and my favorite is helping people grow to know Jesus better to discipling them. That's by far my favorite part of my job. And, and oftentimes I get the opportunity to spend time one-on-one -on -one with somebody and work with them on their walk with Jesus. It's so powerful. Right now I have 12 different uh, people that I study with every week as they're preparing for this baptism, but they continue on their journey. Um, there's some sitting right here that I've had the pleasure of going through with them. In fact, uh, several years ago, a, a pastor friend of mine named Luke Steen, he and I wrote a year-long disciple trek journey. And uh, we usually go through that with different people. And it goes through everything from the fundamental beliefs of Adventism to how to live as a disciple to uh, the church history and where you fit in that. And then a specific section on how to make disciples. And so um, I love watching people grow and their algorithms shift as they go through this journey with me. It's so powerful. You, you can see changes, especially in that section where we talk about living as a disciple, like, like how to have a rich and growing prayer life like how to be stuck in the word of God, like how to fast and how does that impact your, your walk with Jesus? Or, or what is real worship and how can you really have this rich experience with the most high God every time you worship? And to see people change is so powerful, to see their algorithms shift. In fact, uh, recently, and probably over the last six or eight months, I've been studying with this young lady, here she is on the screen. This is my friend Kay, Kay Protasio. She is pretty cool. Um, Kay, are you here this morning? You were texting me earlier. Maybe she's not. Her sister was here earlier. Uh, Kay's awesome. She's an eighth grader at Fleece. She uh, plays in the band over there. In fact, it was six or eight months ago that the Fleece band was playing at the, in the sanctuary, and I had a baptism, and I said, are there any others that would want to follow in these steps? And she raised her hand, and so we've been spending time together. Kay's family understands that if you're not growing closer to Jesus, you're probably drifting away. And her family is a shining example of the effort it takes to stay connected and close to him and staying in his presence. Because every morning, and I'm talking weekdays, I'm talking weekends, I'm talking vacations, the family wakes up at six o'clock in the morning. For some of you, that's very early. And the family gathers together and they open the word of God and they read together. They'll read a devotional book together. They'll spend intentional time in prayer. They do this because they understand then unless you're growing closer to Jesus, you're probably drifting away from his presence. And Eve, as she stands there in front of this tree, she finds herself fully drifted away from the sight of God. She sta finds herself standing before this tree, the one tree that God told her not to be around. And as she stands there, she finds someone else there too, and it's Satan. You know he's the original influencer, right? Here's how Revelation describes his influence. Here's what it says. Revelation says, the great dragon was hurled down that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He understands his mission, which is just to influence all of humanity, to pull them away from God. He's the OG influencer. And as Eve stands before this place, she shouldn't be. She experiences the influence of the devil. 
He knew exactly what to give her. Just a little intrigue, maybe a little wonder, maybe a little excitement of what could be. And as he teases her with this, he, his, his sing-songy voice, this voice from the former choir director of heaven, he seduces her heart away from God. He probably plucked a piece of fruit and hands it to her. She might have just grabbed it out of reaction. You know how when some people hand you something, you just kind of take it from them? He hands it to her and she takes it and now it's in her hand. She's already sinned. And so why not just take a bite as well? Uh, what's the harm? Just a nibble. After all, it was good for food, pleasing to the eye, and would give wisdom. And so she takes the bite and the trickle down effect of the influence begins. Because it's not just her. Eve is tricked and deceived, but Adam joins the scene as Adam joins her and Eve hands him the fruit and he too, even though he knows it's wrong, even though he, he knows it goes against God, the influence of the world around him, the algorithm influences his choice and he eats it too. You know, in our world where everything seems to be clamoring for our attention, feels like everything's trying to influence us. Billboards, uh, flyers in the mail, uh, your own peers, your colleagues, everything's trying to influence, influence us. And it seems that everything is designed to intentionally distract and turn our gaze and pull us away and force us to drift from God. Just the natural algorithm that exists in life, your friends, your parents, coworkers, media, social media, whatever the world tells you is best and right and fun, all of it, the algorithm of life is constantly influencing us. In fact, I, I wanna leave you with this piece. If you don't remember anything else, remember this. We'll put it on the screen for you. Unless you are influencing the world for the kingdom of heaven, then the world is probably influencing you. I'm gonna read it again. Unless you are influencing the world for the kingdom of heaven, the world is probably influencing you. See, I believe that disciples, that's followers of Jesus, we're not just called to live a good life that honors God. That's good, but I think this is better. I think he's called us to be influencers in the world for the kingdom of heaven. It's why Jesus calls us the light of the world. He uses this metaphor of, of all the people connected to him, the source of light, like little dots of light all over the globe that form this beautiful picture of who God is. It's why he calls us the salt of the earth, little granules of salt that add flavor to the blandness of this world. I like how Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians as he's talking about the gospel message and he talks about our calling too. Here's what he says, 2 Corinthians 5.11, he says, we know what it means to fear the Lord. We know to respect him, to give him reverence, to, to be in awe and wonder of who he is. We know what it means to fear the Lord and so we try to persuade others he says it's your calling, it's your duty as a disciple and follower of Jesus to influence others, to change the algorithm. He goes on in verse 20, here's what he says. He says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. Isn't that beautiful? Are you hearing this? Because of you, the algorithm should change. Because of you, the world should change. Because of you, the world should be influenced. Because of you, the love of Jesus should spread like wildfire. It should give hope that shines through the hearts of all the believers. It's his ambassadors that should change the algorithm of the planet. That's you. That's FLEA students, that's FLA students, that's moms and dads that work in the community, that's people that work at Advent Health, that's people that are intentionally building relationships with their neighbors. It's everybody. You are called to be an ambassador of the gospel and to change the algorithm of the planet. I'm gonna leave you with a story. It's a story that I've talked about before. For some of you, you know. But in just over two months, Jen and I are flying to Scotland to baptize this lady right here. This is Nat. She's a, a friend of mine. Um, in fact, she is my uh, leadership coach that I found online, and she, um, uh, we started coaching sessions, and it turns out that she definitely has interest in God, and so our coaching sessions turned into Bible studies to the point where she understood who God was, 
as she felt his love for her, she couldn't believe that he loves her this much. And as she's understood what his completeness looks like, she's decided to be baptized, and it's powerful. Um, now, here's the thing is that there's not a local Adventist church there in Scotland for her. The closest one is more than an hour away. Uh, so there's not this Adventist community that can hold her and, and build her up and, and care for her. Um, so we're flying over there, and I'm going to get to baptize her. And I'm so excited about it. I can't wait. Less than two months. I'll send you pictures. I'll bring you back a kilt. Just kidding. <laughs> she has a community around her. It's very small. It's two or three people in her town that are also Christians. They love Jesus, and they know that they've seen her journey with Jesus. And so they've partnered with her, and, and they communicate with her, and they have Bible studies every week or so. They, they have a, a Bible reading plan on the Bible app that they read together. It's pretty cool. She's one of her clients named Tom. He ha he's a Christian, so he's influenced her too. But if you want to know the real change in her algorithm, her algorithm of life, you've got to go to her Instagram. She's told me uh, that it's changed. I met her six or eight months ago. I don't remember how many months ago it was. She, uh, she said that her algorithm has changed. I'm an Instagram friend with her. We send reels back and forth. I regularly try to send her Bible verses or songs that are important to me or, or, or influential songs. And, and her, she says that her Instagram feed is completely different. No longer is it in astrology. No longer is it in new age. No longer is it in mysticism and weird stuff. Instead, it's Jesus over and over again. Songs about him, scripture about him, reels about him. Her algorithm has changed. Instead of the algorithm influencing her, her algorithm has been influenced. Oh, how incredible it is to be called influencers and ambassadors and algorithm changers of the kingdom. Amen. What an honor it is to be salt and light in a dark world that's full of blandness. How humbling it is to know that God has called you to change the world. May we live the gospel in such a way that the world's algorithm is changed because of you. Let me pray for you this morning. God in heaven, I'm challenged this morning to make a bigger difference than I can. I pray that you'll take this church full of people that love you, that you'll light fires that spread across the globe, that we will truly be your ambassadors, your influencers, and may the world's algorithm change because of our presence here in this world. God, we love you, and we can't wait to see you. In Jesus' name, amen. One quick announcement as the FLA band will close with postlude. After they're done, uh, if you're willing, we'll take the chairs that are not black and we'll put them in the big plastic cases. That would help us tremendously. Thank you.